And if you have questions, write them down, hold them, because uh, we'll have the others up uh, at the end. Uh, we're now going to go to CDISC with uh, Peter von Riesel. I should have got the more, no, more or less. Uh, um, so uh, uh, Peter has been involved in a number of things in pharma around clinical trials, um, and in, and he is um, uh, since 2018 the chief standards officer uh, for CDISC, which is the organisation he'll talk about now. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you for the organization for inviting me to talk about uh, about CDISC. Um, can I see some hands maybe? Who has ever heard about CDISC? Oh, that's really not that bad, good. But there's still some new souls to convert. So uh, I have a small introduction. I'm going to talk about CDISC. What is CDISC? What is our background? And I've been asked to talk a little bit about what are, what are our PGX uh, X, uh, activities. And uh, some kind people within the CDISC organization gave me some slides, so don't ask me too much around uh, genomics, right? I'm more of a data standards guy. I would also like to check a little bit of our, our forward view. Uh, where are we going? So CDISC, CDISC is an acronym. Uh, as data standards organizations, we love our acronyms. It stands for Clinical Data Interchange Standards Consortium. It was founded in 1997, and since 2000, this is a non-profit organization, right? Um, our mission is to develop and support global platform independent data standards that enable uh, information system interoperability. Um, the best way how you're going to know CDISC is that right now both FDA and PMDA are mandating CDISC for submissions. That means that whenever any pharma company wants to bring their drug on the market, they need to make sure that their data is represented using the CDISC standards. That's a very strong mandate because it makes CDIS the de facto language between CROs, between pharma companies, biotechs out there. Yeah. CDISC is a very small company, it's only 40 employees out there, but we have a very large impact. Uh, we have a very, very large user community out there. Basically, all pharma companies, biotech, CROs, a very large bunch of volunteers who are helping us create our standards. It's a very large community. Um, how do you become a member? Via your organization. At this point in time, CDISC is supported by more than 450 organizational members. Now, once your organization, for example, GSK or Pfizer or IQVIA, once you become a member, all of the employees automatically become members. So it's, it's quite, quite large. Yeah? Um, it's all about consensus-based standard development. So. What we do out there, it's not CDs that says, and this is the standard. We work together with our volunteers to create a standard. We open that for public review. So even if you're not a member of CDISC, you get to give your review and your feedback, which will be taken into account before we publish this. Okay. Bit of a geographical overview, as you can see, these are the member uh, counts out there. It's not only pharma companies, as you can see, who are CDISC members, also the CROs, uh, tech providers. And what I would like to show, I'm not sure if this pointer works, you see that over there, that academic institutions used to be zero a couple of years ago. We can really see a massive growth out there. Yeah? Academic research is more and more discovering the world of the CDISC standards, and we're, we're welcoming that, of course. Okay? CDISC does not stand by itself. Eh? We're not an island. Um, First of all, we are very much engaged with regulatory agencies such as FDA, PMDA, because they are endorsing our standard. Whenever FDA and PMDA has certain requirements, certain needs towards the standards, of course they talk with CDIS because we want to ensure that our standards are taking on board their requirements. Um, but also we talk with the other standards organizations out there. What CDIS could try to prevent is inventing a standard if it already exists, right? For example, um, what CDISC has done at some point in time, we need a standard for the date and time, eh, to represent the date and time. We didn't invent something new, we, we used the ISO 8601 standard, eh, just as an example. Okay. And if, as you can also see, therapeutic area partnerships, I'll come back to that later, uh, for the last eight to nine years, a lot of the effort of CDISC went into expanding the standards into the different therapeutic area or disease areas. Yeah? Bit of an overview of what are these standards, eh, the foundational standards as we call them. What CDISC is doing, they provide you with normative standards, right, all the way from protocol representation, 
to data collection, to data aggregation, bringing the data together, to data analysis, right? Um, we also have our acronyms for that, so C dash and SETM and ADAM structures, yeah? Um, also, of course, preclinical data. Huh? We have a standard out there to, to store your preclinical data in a standardized way. That preclinical uh, data standard sent also today, FDA and PMDA, whenever you are sending preclinical data as a part of your submission, you have to use send, CDISC send for that. Okay. Now, these are the foundational standards. It's a normative standard. What does that mean? You can have all kind of information. It's telling you exactly how to store this, in which tables, in which domains we call them, in which tables, in which variables, and which control terminology to use. Now, that's great, but it doesn't standardize the information just yet, right? So what we have done, what we started to do since 2008, and it was really the FDA that started asking the first questions, we started creating what we call therapeutic area user guides. And you can see all these colors, there is a massive amount already available, and this effort is continuing uh, to be done. Therapeutic Area User Guides, it's a guide which is telling us exactly, in a specific disease area, you can see them over there, how am I going to collect my data using that foundational standard, how am I going to aggregate my data, and how am I going to analyze my data in a standardized way. So it's already kind of like the start of an information standard through these therapeutic areas. Yeah. So specifically around PGX, now please no genomic questions for me because I'm a data standard nut. Someone has given me these, these slides. Um, what we do know is that within CDISC there is a team, right, a team of volunteers again, which was established in 2007. It took me a little bit more than eight years yeah, to finally publish their first official PGX guide, right? Now, eight years, of course, this is also going for public review, and, and, and so it really took a while to publish this, but there is a decent guide out there. Now, since 2007 or even 2015, the science keeps evolving. You know this better than I. Uh, today, what is available in that uh, CDISC guide? The high-level concepts, such as SNPs, insertions, deletions, genotyping. I'm reading the slide now. Eh? Therapeutic areas and incremental concepts. So all, while we were creating these different therapeutic areas, what we noticed that also specifically in, in the therapeutic area realm, we also needed additional uh, pharmacogenomic, uh, I would say, types of data, such as microsatellite instability and mismatch repair. That's how far I'm going to go with that. Yeah. Exciting news. Um, oh, let me add this one first. Over here in gray, you can see these variables over there, like PF test, PF spec for specimen, RS for original result. These are CDISC variables. And this is an example on how we're going to translate that genomic data into our uh, very rigid and robust uh, standard out there. Yeah? Just as an example. Um, what does this pharmacogenomic implementation guide cover more. It also covers uh, specimen collection. So how do I how do I standardize specimen collection, the handling and also the processing details are covered in detail. So in our standard, there's a standard way to represent and collect that information. Ongoing discussions with the FDA, because of course FDA is mandating CDISC again, that we are in, in a very beneficial position where we have regular discussions with the FDA. And what I'm going to announce in just a second is that CDISC and that volunteer group is preparing for a, a new iteration of the pharmacogenomics guide, right? At this point in time, we are just having a number of discussions with the FDA. The goal of these discussions is, of course, to understand what do they need? What do they really want? What are they expecting yeah, from that data? Uh, what data do we have to submit? Uh, will a subset uh, suffice of large data sets? Nomenclature, what type of nomenclature do we want to use? What kind of substandards do we want to use in our representation standard? What is the required level of detail in the sample handling and processing? It's not only, of course, the FDA that we're listening to, right? That's one stakeholder. We're also listening to our community. What is the real science out there? What data are you collecting in your clinical studies and what's the best way to represent them? It's CDISC's, I would say, job to bring, to merge those together, if that makes sense. So what's next? We're going to expand use cases for cytogenetics. 
We're also going to expand CRF design for the collection of gen genetics and genomics data. And so one of the strengths of CDSC is that it also provides you with a standard way to collect your data. That means that EDC systems out there will eventually use one library to collect your data always in a very similar fashion. Yeah. Gene expression expansion to include population and cohort. Capturing the metadata as well to uh, describe key aspects for trial design of genetic and genomic testing. Uh, and this is a project which we just started scoping, but in 2019, a lot of the work is going to be done. So right now we have a call for volunteers. Yeah? Um, the new work plan is being prepared. The call for volunteers, we do have data standards experts. We do have people who understand CDISC. What we need over here is we need scientists and we need ontologists to help us understand the science. Yeah? If, we can, if you can help us understand the science, we can create a decent data standard out of that. That's the idea. Development timeline, I'm not going to go over the dates, but as you can see, a very large part of the work is being planned for 2019. So the time to volunteer, if you want to be a part of this, is really now. It's an open call. I would really love if some of you step up. And that's what we're doing right now. Okay. A little bit of a forward view. Yeah, I'm just, just going to take a few minutes. The forward view is, as you have seen, uh, see this right now at this point in time, we have a normative standard. So these foundational standards to collect again, aggregate and analyze our data. We do have some implementation guides for therapeutic areas. But what we are trying to do is we are trying to create an, inform an informative standard. Yeah? And this is what we are going to try to do. Um, well, this proof of concept is being going to be announced at the US Exchange really next week. Yeah? We're going to launch a proof of concept yeah, within CDISC. What we're going to do is we're going to store and use our data science as linked metadata, as concepts, and we're going to create meaning between the concepts. Meaning between the concepts, not only meaning, semantic meaning, but also it should be computer readable and even computer executable. Because the use case that we have in mind for such a data map, yeah, yeah, concept maps, over here you can see an example of an analysis concept, right? The use cases that we have in mind, what we really want to do at the end of the concept is we want to show that we can pull that metadata out of CDISC share, that's our global metadata repository, that we can pull data and that we can actually, by selecting the tables, listings and figures, in a clinical research study, right, that the system is smart enough to navigate that data map, to pull out my analysis standards, to pull out my aggregation standards, right, to pull out my collection standards, and pull all that information out in a metadata selection, right? End-to-end -end functionality. The next part of the use case is that we're actually going to take that selection and we're going to create our data sets, our empty data sets, and we're going, even going to take it that far to create data sets, including the metadata. And we're also going to create our tables, listings, and figures, shells, our computer readable endpoint definitions. And the next step is we're going to do start to end data processing. In our concept, it's our ambition to really prove that we have that information model right, to pull out our data, to automatically pull that data from an EDC database, to create our SETM or our aggregation database, to create our analysis database, and to automate our analysis as far as we can take it. Right? As far as we know, this has not been done before uh, in our industry, certainly not within CDISC. So wish us luck. Um, this is probably going to take a couple of years before we can really show you something decent out of it. But um, that's where we're going. Thank you. Thank you. Well,